Welcome to the Digital Footprint, a podcast for leaders in healthcare, public health, and education who are looking to leverage technology to solve problems and make a big impact. In each episode, we interview innovators and entrepreneurs who are solving the most challenging problems facing these industries. Join us as we dig into the colossal tasks involved in bringing a new digital product to life. Welcome to the Digital Footprint. Hello and welcome to the Digital Footprint. I'm Richard Sims, and this podcast is brought to you by Tyrannosaurus Tech, an award-winning technology partner dedicated to designing and developing high-impact software products. I'm excited to be joined today by Scott Aragetti, co-founder and CEO of MiAlma. Great to have you on the show, Scott. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this. So I was thinking back, you know, we first were introduced a few years ago, and I think Mi Alma was in its infancy or kind of concept phase. So I'm really excited to unpack where you all are now and how far you've come with it. I know you've also been very active as an advisor and investor in a number of interesting startups around town. So I'm eager to hear your perspective on startups in general and, you know, everything that's kind of changing in the landscape there. So yeah, well, let's get started. So first, would you mind just briefly introducing yourself and just tell us a little bit about Mi Alma? Yeah, of course. So Scott Arigetti, my wife and I, with Jordan and I are co-founders of a company called Mi Alma, and we both are veterans of the Atlanta, uh, the Atlanta technology community and worked in startups all around town in different industries. Um, I've worked at a handful of different unicorns. Jordan spent seven years at Salesloft, and as you mentioned earlier, we a little bit of angel and angel investing and advising the last handful of years. We had uh, two kids in 18 months, second of which was born uh, almost three years ago, March 30th, 2020. So given the, uh, the pandemic, it was pretty wild Q2 that year. So I was behind the job at Adobe. I just started as head of sales of the company here in Atlanta and focused more on the house to kind of help her. Uh, and then when she went back to work after her mat leave, we built Aragon Endeavors, which is this little vehicle for some decent angel investing and advising and still stay close to startups, still learn as much as we could and have our hand in helping founders scale, given the bandwidth and given the challenges at home. Uh, it wasn't the right time in our life to be the early stage employee um, or to be a founder ourselves. But we had this idea that's become the Alma that we felt very, that we felt had some, had some potential. Um, so we started doing some discovery, uh, more of me than her, because she was still full time until about a little year ago, around two years ago, started doing some discovery. And that has evolved into what is now Rioma. Um, so high level we all know is, um, it's the place to support grievers. It is built for families that are either about to experience a loss of a loved one or recently have. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And I know, you know, you and Jordan are awesome, first of all, and have a really extensive background in tech. I love it. So like looking back at your background, I mean, what led you kind of into this entrepreneurship? Yeah. passion for startups like where did that all come from because you, you've been at it for a while yeah i think a lot of it stems from just the energy and the general and the scale in the company it was something palpable when you're you've kind of been involved in that you've kind of seen it and been part of a team that's experienced some growth you know it can be very addictive it can be very exciting and i think that passion i think that chasing that kind of just that energy is you know it, there's a handful of other professions that just kind of seem low to be blind and you are just for it in, in, in comparison Mm-hmm. Where I do the same thing every day, kind of just going, get going along at a steady pace, just just wasn't kind of how I'm wired. Never been scared of taking risks. Never been scared of, of being ambitious and trying to accomplish big things professionally or personally. Sometimes it hits, and sometimes it doesn't. But that's I think part of the the, the draw for me in in getting into the space and staying in the space of trying to really have a big impact. Um, but as it relates to me, all know this is an area that we've been kind of studying and really been thinking about uh, these six, seven years, perhaps, perhaps a little more. So kind of known in the back of our head that at some point in life, we were going to take it, uh, we we're, were going to take a shot at building what we thought was needed and, and kind of avoid in the marketplace. And that's, that's what Mialma has become. Awesome. Awesome. So yeah, let's talk uh, more about Mialma, of course. So, you know, your mission is naturally like so different than a lot of the types of things most startup founders are pursuing, right? Um, and again, I think it's a really powerful mission, but yes, it's so different than, hey, we're building this cool app, you know, for XYZ. 
So what led you to focus on this space? You know, it's grief, death, loss, like what kind of the origin story? I know you said you and Jordan had been seeing the need for quite a while. Yeah. So I think there's, there's really three things we talk about about like you know, how the idea kind of came about and kind of how it led us in this path. First is that I never met my mom's parents. My maternal grandparents um, lived in Virginia. My mom was from, I was born and raised in Atlanta. Both passed before I was born. Grandma died a few months before I was born and he said, she's who I'm naming it after. And um, I had, I was lucky to have 31 years with my dad's dad. And my dad's mom was thankfully still alive. And I see her all the time. They both lived and still live in Atlanta. My grandma saw all that. So it was always weird growing up, but I knew so much more about one set of grandparents than the other. And um, it didn't sit well. It kind of felt almost a little embarrassing on um, that. Like I just knew so much more. And it began to kind of dawn on me more and more that, you know, there's no Wikipedia page for my mom's parents, no Wikipedia page for Gail and Sue and Jolene. And I don't even have a grandparent names for them. And as I started having kids and realizing that, like, okay, there's, there's, if I don't really feel like connected to them, how are my kids going to? So this notion of like, they're not being the place for me to go to at once, being able to see all the pictures and read all the stories. Eventually, it kind of turned into, well, why isn't there? What if there was? And what if we just went ahead and built it? That's the first part. The second part is really coming at it more as a supporter of, as I've gotten older and gone to my share of funerals and more of my services and people I know that have passed away who are supporting friends that have, have gone through a loss. Um, the fast approach felt increasingly insufficient, almost inadequate, where you would have, whether the passing was anticipated or sudden, you hear the news, go to an event, you maybe you know, be supportive for the first handful of weeks and you go to an event at someone's home to kind of help, help the family, maybe make a donation or send food, whatever, just flowers. And then after a couple of weeks, we kind of begin to notice this kind of cool environment that, that exists where generally speaking for the first month or so, everyone, all the supporters are surrounding the family, they're bringing meals, flowers, they're found, they're helping out. Um, and they're most engaged while the grievers, the primary grievers are kind of in this opposite headspace where they're not, they're processing, trying to figure out what's going on. It's very hard, emotionally, certainly off the logistic, just life is normal. And after generally a month, of course, it depends on certain variables, it kind of flips where all of the grievers are kind of beginning to come out of their shell for the most part and trying to understand more of what this new routine could look like, their new normal. And that's when all the supporters begin to kind of move on with their life and stop calling, it's not texting. Some community over. So we kind of identified this in our personal experience. And there's one girl in particular who was um, a very close friend of my sister's, who whose little brother is one of my closest friends. And she uh, very tragically was diagnosed with cancer and, and passed away about a year later, about five years ago. And she had two kids that are at the time five and seven. And after she passed, my sister and a lot of her close friends and a lot of people, other people that we know. In the community, you know, went on Facebook, you know, wrote these posts talking about, you know, um, about this world in the past and sharing stories and inside jokes and pictures and just beautiful content. And they got, you know, very strong trash as you can imagine. And I remember telling Jordan, like, are our kids ever going to see this? Like, where's this stuff? It just kind of gets like pushed down you know, on someone's Facebook wall. Like, that's not, Facebook wasn't built for this. So that's really the second part, coming at this as a supporter and seeing this kind of gap in the standard kind of, you know, process that happened keeps something we know passes. The third, the third is early COVID realities of just how incredibly sad and tragic it was. All this grief and isolation, Zoom funerals, Zoom memorials, people having to say goodbye to a loved one, a spouse, a parent, through a glass window kind of holding it like that. Oh, that's terrible. People were just vanishing, it felt like, and their stories weren't being told. And what even before we thought was inadequate was dramatically more inadequate given just, given what was happening in the world for, you know, most of 2020 and even some, in, it's even some into 21, that that was kind of like the final push for us. We've talked about this idea for a few years. We figured it would happen later on in life when our careers were at different, at different, at different, different points, but the pandemic had this way of kind of like, um, forcing people to kind of, kind of re to, to rethink their priorities and their timeline. And in a way it was kind of liberating. So we took inspiration from this sense of okay, we're kind of like already off-roading on heavy candy endeavors, having a baby and, and a newborn coming to the hospital, you know, on April 3rd, I think it was when we got her in the hospital. I was like, what if we cling to? We may as well just, you know, the time is right now. Time is, the time is right now. 
to give this a shot. So that is what led us to kind of begin discovery of, you know, doing deep discovery of talking to everyone that we knew like has been in the space, whether directly as a griever or a supporter, which is effectively everybody. And then spiritual leaders and nonprofit heads and what we are, anyone that was kind of remotely, you know, in this ecosystem and it's evolved from there. Yeah. Thank you. It's a really good explanation of kind of the various pain points that you all are trying to address. Right. And exactly as you just said, I think that unfortunately pretty much everyone, at least most adults have dealt with, you know, a death of a loved one. So it's a pretty universal experience and something that we've all observed, like all the different angles of that. So, you know, one question I have is like, startups are so exciting and exhilarating and they're difficult to, to say the least. And I'm sure Mialma is very exciting and exhilarating and there's like a lot of positive energy, but it's like, how do you kind of balance? Cause it's a pretty heavy topic, you know, naturally. And you also are, you know, you have to be sensitive, of course, with folks you're dealing with that are grieving or just folks that are kind of in the ecosystem. So it's like, how do you all kind of balance these two day to day? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it, you're right. It's very delicate and it's, it's an interesting thing because, you know, I've worked in different companies and in different industries across my career. From, you know, high school sports media to waste and recycling tech to supply chain warehousing and marketing tech. Now I'm in a completely different headspace every day. So it's definitely an adjustment, but you know, what we, what, what our, like our guiding light is that it's, it's meaningful and it's, and it's, and it's, and it's, it's important. I mean, it's very emotional that you have to be delicate you have to have a certain kind of mentality to, 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 to go into the space and to see this need and want to address it and want to tackle it. And yeah, it's certainly difficult sometimes emotionally. I mean, we've actually recently uh, said that we have, uh, we have brought on a, almost like an emotional support outlet for employees to be able to have some talk to, I wouldn't say therapy, but someone that can kind of almost be like therapeutic and helping us kind of uh, serve our own emotional needs. Cause it's important for our employees to be able to say that like, this is hard and this is emotional. And when you're, you spend your days talking to people that are either that are in grief on anticipating before the passing occurs or, or once it has occurred and talk to people that have lost a parent or a child or a sibling or a spouse or a group of workers, someone that was very, that was very close to that they loved. It's a very, it's a very emotional thing. So yeah, there are ways that we have to be additional that can, you know, one of our core values, the most important of our core value is do no harm, where it's important to us to be as proactive as we possibly can be. And making sure that both the experience and the messaging and everything around the experience doesn't cause additional pain or anguish for a griever. Our, our goal, our goal high level is to connect almost like to, to bridge the disconnect that exists between supporters. So you have this interesting balance where it's like, are you serving the griever or are you serving the deceased or are you serving the supporter? Mm. And we kind of struggle that line in different ways at different points because you want to celebrate the deceased and we want to honor the deceased, but it really is at the end of the day, and we think kind of mostly about the griever because the supporters exist to support the griever. So that's kind of where we kind of try to focus, but yeah, it's definitely, it can be hard. It can be emotional. And sometimes when you're talking to, you know, a widow that lost her husband, has young kids, you know, I've been lying to said that there were times that, you know, both my wife and I, once they broke down in tears, but like got a little emotional ourselves because. It's just a very sad thing, but for us, that's kind of why we're doing this because we mm -hmm. do see opportunity to be helpful. We do see a need to make a difference and to make an impact in people's lives. And that's and obviously there's a goal financially for every company to get to some of folks, but for us, it's also just like the ROI for us is also part of uh, getting that support from the reader, having someone say, thank you, this was incredibly helpful. I can't wait to show my kids as we make it older or having the kids say, thank you. I now feel closer to my father. I, I who passed when I was younger than I did, you know, a month ago, because now I have a real on the page that I can learn about them. Yeah, for sure. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that no question you all can, you know, as you shut off work for the night, like feel very proud of the impact you're having and what you're building towards. And you know, death is a part of life. It, going anywhere. So the more you can bring, you know, bring value and peace and experience. Yeah. And kind of right. Like you mentioned earlier, grief is, 
is a universal part of the human experience. Everyone will go through it at some point in their life, likely multiple times. And you'll also will be a supporter probably many more times in your life than someone you know in your past or someone you know is, is, is going through loss. So that's when we kind of looked around and we'll look and kind of notice the technology that was currently available, currently kind of in use in a, you know, in a macro sense in these situations and kind of realize that there really was room for a modern piece of technology kind of built with a sense of sympathy and empathy and almost a sense of compassion. And I'm like, this just kind of, it's like, talk a lot about like this, this phrase of there should be a place, there should be a place to do, you know, this laundry, this thing, it should be a place to be able to, to collect pictures, stories, speeches, and videos of the deceased. There should be a place to support the family whenever they need, you know, in a modern sense, there should be a place for the family to be able to communicate effectively and efficiently with their, with their village of supporters. So this, I mean, there should be a place that's coming at it from this, this perspective of like, this needs to exist and this should exist. And in a way, what we're really doing is asking everyone we talk to you to like, help us figure it out because. I don't pretend to say that right now at this iteration, Mioma has everything figured out and we have built the exact tool that will meet everyone's need as best as it possibly could. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it's but we're, we're, we're on this mission. We're on this journey because we see that there needs to be a place that does these things. So that's why we're trying as proactive as we can to listen to all the certain stakeholders to grievers, to supporters, to children, to parents, to spiritual leaders, to hospice care professionals, to federal album directors of saying, okay, how can we build and really adjust and iterate this technology to meet this gap, this massive gap that everyone acknowledges exists. And that's part of the challenge and frankly, part of the fun. You know, like I've always loved putting in the puzzles my entire life. And in a way, this is just one giant emotional, meaningful puzzle that many companies have tried to capture and many of them still are. And I'm sure many of them love more in the future. Like it's not everyone realizes the universality of this. So it's an attractive way in some, in some, in some senses, if you can kind of handle the emotions and the awkwardness of it to build around, because everyone knows you said it's to get them taxes and so everyone goes through it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the, that's all great. And you know, one thing that. I know just from having touch points with you and Jordan, again, your wife and co-founder over the last few years, it's you all are very methodical about how you've approached it. Like, I think you've been super thorough in your customer discovery, right? Which is super important. <laughs> so I love like how carefully you all have kind of sourced input from all those folks. And I'm sure that's gone a long way towards this initial iteration of the product. So. Yeah. You alluded to some of the functionality and again, I know everything's evolving and I'm sure it will in a healthy way, but give us a sense of like what the platform is at this stage, what's kind of the core functionality and love to, to get into that a yeah. little bit. There's a few things I want to call out. The first is, um, at the kind of towards the top of every on what page. And again, a page can be built, it's effectively like a profile page. So a page can be built for someone that either is about to, to pass recently has passed or even has passed years ago. And towards the top, we have what we call a collaboration. And this link is effectively a URL, a two that page. And the thought is that we want to make it very easy for grievers or even supporters to share that link so that the ultimate goal is that, you know, when, when a, when a passing occurs, that link is included in the image, right? It's included in the Facebook post. It's included in the email that goes out, maybe from a house of worship to congregation. So as people are hearing the news that someone's passed, this link is bringing everyone to the same spot. We're trying to avoid a situation where a griever is going through all the emotion, all the logistics and the world's been turned upside down, a primary griever, where they are bombarded by well-intentioned, well-meaning supporters that are all hitting them up on Facebook and text and email and stories you get in person in the wall service, maybe cards with letters, maybe there's comments and they go on the on wheelchair. And it's everywhere and it's overwhelming and it, it, it forces this, 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 this challenge of like, what do I do with all, where do I put all this stuff? Drop on the mm -hmm. folder. Like there really is one family-wide, community-wide repository of content that lives on in perpetuity. All right. So that's part of what we almost built for. So the first tab you'll see when you come to a page is a memories tab. And this is where it is a, just a, a, a beautiful display of content, all the pictures and stories and speeches. 
Tim videos even that anyone that knew that loved one is sharing. Um, so that's an important thing here. And what we have in there is what we call prompts. So if you go to the guest book of the funeral home website and you look at, you know, a page that has effectively like a profile page, it has the obituary, maybe information, the funeral, I mean, funeral details on that guest book. What generally happens is most people, most people say, you know, a variation of like four or five things. So sorry for your loss or maybe maybe be at the last city or let me know how I can help you. I'm so sorry. But there's not always a lot of depth and substance in stories. So these prompts that we offer, which are very broad questions of, or something you met them, or tell us about your story about them, or some words that you think they'd like to be remembered by, or what one thing their kids or grandkids would like to know about them, to kind of really draw these stories out. Because the stories exist in the minds and the hearts of everyone that knew that person, their colleagues, their classmates, their neighbors, their friends, like everyone that's kind of been there in their ecosystem. So when they pass, those families, like that's what they find. Like they want to learn about their loved one through the eyes of everyone that knew them, especially if the primary grievers didn't know that person. So when you can have a situation where a widow tragically loses your husband, but now, and, and now at this like is like an equal thing because of course it's still incredibly sad and tragic, but with, for her to be able to see pictures or hear stories of some of his old colleagues and classmates that she never she wouldn't otherwise meet. That can be a very cathartic thing for them to now everyone is keeping that person alive. We talked a lot of, in our discovery over the last two years, a lot of counselors, therapists, and really just like experts that are, that are, that are working in school for decades and gone to school on this and practice this. And what they told us is there's two main fears. And, and, and like, I'll get back to the question about the tab in a minute, but I want to kind of go here for a second. The two main fears in the space are the fear of forgetting and the fear of being forgotten. So the fear of a supporter or griever forgetting certain things about their loved one as time goes on and the fear of that deceit being forgotten. Mm -hmm. So trying to really address both of those. So if you have a picture or story or memory, or even just, you know, characteristics of a person you want to share, you can, you can put it on the memories tabs and now it, it's like documented and locked in grammar and the site itself and this collaboration like ensures that that person will never be forgotten because it is in a way like this like living moral of sorts that's available in perpetuity so i like to say the first tab is memories the second tab is what we call the support registry similar to a baby or wedding registry and the way it works is you know to kind of tell the story on this you know, generally speaking you hear that a friend of yours or someone you know passed away or someone you know went through a loss what most people think well, the first question most people ask themselves is, how can I help? What can I do? And that could be a hard question to answer because you don't want to bog a grieve and you know, they're going through a lot, but it can be hard to kind of find that clear direction. Like, what do they want? What do they need? Because what you really want to do is you want to feel like you've done something. You want to kind of check the box and make like, okay, I pulled good at that. I did. I made a donation. I sent black with some food, whatever it is. I went to a funeral service or whatever it is. So what we built on support registry is kind of meant to model that. So whether the family is asking for funds directly, either through a GoFundMe or another campaign, wherever they're directing supporters to make a donation in honor of the deceased to, whether to house of worship or a nonprofit or whatever causes near and dear to their heart, you can link to it very easily there. There's a meal train if they're, they're actually organizing third party support for meals or groceries. Do DoorDash or Uber Eats or whatever it is. You can do all that through the site with point C click ease and use of functionality. And then also in there, we have what we call volunteering time and energy. And this is the kind of thing that isn't applicable in every use case. When my grandfather passed away in 2015, you know, my grandma didn't really need this, but a widow that loses her husband at 40 years old and has, has two young kids would. And what this basically does is it gives a chance for the griever or someone acting on their behalf, like a lieutenant who could be an admin of the page, for them to say certain things that would be helpful. So, for example, there is someone that comes to mind that lost her husband a handful of years ago, and and, and, and at the time of his path, he was passing, uh, had two kids that were like four and five years old, and there was a GoFundMe that was built to support her and her kids and a meal train. And what she told me was that those were certainly appreciated. But what she really wanted more than anything, or relative, well, was someone to cut the grass or just handle it. Just like one less thing for her to worry about. Just hire a guy, pay a guy, 
lock it in every you know two weeks, month, whatever it was, just like one less thing on, on our plate. So mm-hmm. that's kind of the spirit behind the volunteering section of the sport registry, whether it's cutting the grass or laundry or going through doing the dishes or going through the deceased belongings or taking the kids to soccer practice or coming over to visit or walking the dog, whatever it is, we're trying to connect supporters that want to take action and be helpful, but don't really know what to do, where to do it. And don't really want to act. Like, it's like kind of awkward to ask if they're going to text mm-hmm. with the graders that do have these needs, but also feel some offers of being like, Hey, so-and-so, will you come take my kid to school or you come watch or walk my dog? So like, we're trying to kind of simplify that and to also allow the page admin, which can be a friend or lieutenant, it could be someone close to the family that's not a direct primary reader, although it also can be, to kind of coordinate more effectively and efficiently on behalf of the screeners. So the memories, so memories and then support registry. The third tab for now is what we call messages from family. And the thought here is to give this communication channel, this one to many channel where the grievers can share updates or announcements or requests with their community of supporters. So it could be details of funeral arrangements or memorial service. This time, this address, we'd love to see you there. Or next Saturday is the memorial walk. Here's where we're going to meet. Here's the flyer. We'd love to see you there. Or it could be. Here's how the kids are doing. Here's what we're doing to honor, you know, honor dad. Or it could be a request. Kid, a child could say, well, trying to figure, we're trying to learn more about what dad was like in college. You know, how many picture stories in that chapter of his life. So you're trying to kind of like this kind of ecosystem that forms after that occurs. And while the supporters helping the family, where currently and traditionally kind of begin as a dissolve after a handful of weeks, mm-hmm. trying to kind of that as time goes on, the family can still be supported by those people. And of course, people can follow a page or unfollow a page and the supporters can kind of opt in or out as they want to, but you try to kind of maintain all of that communication channel. So again, there's more in the site and we're building more constantly, but memories, support registry and messages from family are kind of the main three tabs. Awesome. Yeah. That's a good overview and it's a pretty robust products in a good way, I think at, at, you know, essentially full rollout here. So one question I have is, you know, what's it been like, for lack of a better word, kind of selling into this space, right? You of course need to be delicate in your approach as you've already touched on a couple of times, but, you know, I know you all are continuing to explore and I think actively like, oh, this might be something that you know, a religious leader recommends to a family when the time is right as a good resource, or, you know, I'm sure there's these various ways that the grievers at the right time in the right way are introduced to the idea. Like, can you speak a little bit more to you all's experience kind of figuring this out and what you think, um, the right approach is? Yeah, absolutely. It's an interesting thing because traditionally, as far as our research has shown and people we've talked to, this has been like a BDC where someone builds a company and you put it out there and you wait for, for grievers to come in and just, and just buy, or you sign them directly and some no different market channels. And we still do that too. Like someone can come to meowma.com and, and, and create and buy a page they want to insert. And our outward motion, our sales motion is a little different. So what we're trying to really do is also to have this B to B to C play. So. Back up for a second. We're not going to have any ads on the site, no banner ads and pre rolls. It needs to be a very classy, respectful, and a really appropriate environment. There is a cost to build a page. Now it's $100 for a one time cost, and that recurring is available to it. But it's important to us, very important to us, that anyone that wants to be on the page should be able to create one, regardless if they can they, 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 they pass me to pay for it. So, what that means is we want me all to be, at least in part, a network of gifted pages. So when we say give the pages, we're going to have groups of funders, groups of distributors. So a funder is any individual or organization that purchases pages. And when you purchase a page, you can do three things. Well, one, the default is that it goes in the community fund, which is effectively this piggy bank, the debit account that anyone can come and claim what on. Two, you can get to page someone directly. I could have a friend that just lost a grandmother and a hundred dollars. It fires off an email with him. Mm-hmm. The URL. He dedicates his page. He shares his link off and burn. The radio that pages can be purchased and gifted to families through what we call distribution partners. And that's where we are partnering with hospice cares. 
houses of worship, potentially news publication, funeral homes, maybe a big child for bereavement care, maybe hospitals, children's hospitals are adult, maybe it's nonprofits. But that's where we are trying to partner with organizations that both have relationships with families that are either about to or have gone through loss and have some like level of credibility and influence where we can say to a spiritual leader, and again, a partner distribution, they can purchase the pages as well if they want to, but they don't have to. They can either pull a fund or we can work with them to find a funder that can get them to them specifically. So we can go to an organization, a uh, house of worship and say, you, your role in this community is to support these families spiritually, emotionally, to coordinate the support from your entire congregation. When these kind of things happen, we're not giving you this tool that can organize that, that can mobilize that, that can just make your life a little bit easier too, of getting the word out. So that's where a lot of our outbound partnerships, sales kind of motions is formalizing partnership with, uh, I think everything at this point, hospice care and houses of worship are really kind of like one A and one B and all the others are kind of in this kind of like group behind them, but we're still learning and iterating and figuring out. So that's where we view these partnerships as being so effective and so important to us because it's one thing for some, you know, founder and CEO to reach out to a thing and say, Hey, you, know, you should, you should use this. You should, you should have this. You want my product. But if a spiritual leader is saying, Hey, I think this should be helpful for you. And by the way, it doesn't cost you a penny and it may not even cost the, the house of worship a penny. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a lot. Cause again, we don't want to like. We don't want to put paywall between the greeter. Like in that moment, like someone in the ecosystem should be able to sponsor a hundred bucks for a page, whether it's a friend, mm -hmm. whether it's a local family or corporate foundation, whether it is a house of worship, whoever it is, like it, it, it priced that way. So it's not cost prohibitive because we want everyone that acts to because we want volume. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. And I think that, uh, <clears throat> there's obviously kind of a multi-pronged approach there, which, which makes a lot of sense. So one question you and I've touched on this a little bit in the past, like what's it like from a technology and policy standpoint, trying to navigate just some of the unique family dynamics, right? That can surround a loss. We all have families. We all have like interesting aspects to it, hopefully healthy, not always like, I'm just thinking of situations where there might be tension in the family or just understandably strong emotions related to like, who should set this page or do we want to do this? You know, I mean, I'm sure there's no perfect answer, but how are you all kind of starting to wrangle some of that? Yeah, you're right. There is a perfect answer. And I think we, we accept the fact that we're not going to be able to, nor are we really trying to like solve every inner family conflict. There's family dynamics at play in every family. And our position is more so that for those that want this, it, it, it should, for those that want this, it should exist as an offer. And if there's differences between a family, between sibling or between potentially an ex spouse and, and, and children, whatever it is, if there's conflict, then we try to kind of step back and say, like, you know, we can always kind of like not, not turn a page off, but kind of like take it offline temporarily until we can figure it out. And again, we're, we're, we're learning and iterating through all those are And now the most important thing is that we're not, we're not trying to, to be, you know, a psychologist and like can get in between this complex. Um, they, they do arise. They will continue to arise. That's just kind of part of how things work. Our view is more of when there is agreement in the family, everyone's comfortable with this. Think that there should be an offering that does these kinds of things. Um, and if there is a conflict where, you know, one party is, feels very strongly against having some of it, or there's disagreement on, you know, what pay, what picture should be in profile picture or so like, yeah, it's a very important reason to back up, going back to like the, the do no harm piece, family admins have the ability to control certain privacy settings of who has access to view certain content, they can remove any content at any point that they want. They can block a user's ability to post. It's important that the family is in control and really behind the wheel and like what they're doing. We have to be very careful not to be overly prescriptive on how someone needs to be using the own. It's just something 
it's not our place. So when it comes to the family, the family dynamics, we're going to try lightly. And again, we're also still trying to figure this out. There isn't so there isn't a magic answer, and we haven't even gotten close to finding a magic answer. So part of this is just early stage. You know, we're, we're going to keep iterating as we go. Um, but you're exactly right. Like it is, it is one of the things that I will say keeps me up at night, but like we're very attuned to because we know how emotional, sometimes rational. I think grief can be in a way like intoxicating. It can kind of just distract you and, 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 and make people, you know, behave in certain ways that they otherwise wouldn't behave. So, you know, we have to be very mindful about the front end and very delicate and have kind of a very soft touch because, you know, our goal is to help people. And sometimes people may not want that help and maybe it upsets them that a sibling or a cousin or whoever it is creates a page for their loved one that they did want. Mm -hmm. So it really isn't any great answer to that. It's more of we're not trying to solve every family conflict and we're trying to, to kind of listen and learn as best we can. Right. Well, I'm sure you all will find the, the right balance and I think your hearts are in the right place and it's oversimplification, but in a sense, it's not a new problem. I mean, let's say I have someone close to me that passes and I want to, you know, buy a space in a newspaper to do a, a memorial for them. Like, I don't think there's really any checks in place there to make sure that yeah. every other and person. I, and it's also, not it's also part, of the, part of why we're trying to partner with Houses of Worship, because again, not all, but in, in some, perhaps in most cases, hopefully that spiritual leader can also play this like therapeutic role of right, mediating and navigating to where like Miyama isn't the bad guy. Miyama's just trying to say, hey, like, if you want this, we'd love to give it to you. And if you don't want this, like, all great, we're not trying to get in between. Yeah. And it, is it? yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So taking a step back, you know, again, I think that at least, at least from kind of idea phase, I know you all have been thinking about this for quite a while. What are some of the biggest challenges you've come across so far? Again, we all know startups are a roller coaster. Like, does anything stand out that was especially hard or you were like, oh my gosh, I don't know. We're gonna yeah. I mean, one of the challenges is very like, for us, I mean, my wife and I don't, uh, you know, we are, we are not engineers. We call them in my life and they've been called an engineer. So the China Bowl tech company will take the founders that are, and are, you know, at their hearts, salespeople, talkers and more than coders. That was a challenge. That still is some ways a challenge. So, you know, we have been kind of on the hunt, as you know, finding different partners and vendors and advisors and all the different people that can help us bring a product to life. And, you know, it took two years. <laughs> and you know, part of that was, you know, really trying to over index on, on discovery and research and conversations, part because I think that's the way to go in general, part because this is incredibly emotional and delicate and unlike a kind of a traditional B2B SaaS company or widget or app. We can kind of put it out there and iterate, iterate, iterate without really a, lot, a whole lot of downside. There's a lot of emotional downside if we got this wrong. So we, the bar had to be high before we were comfortable putting something out there because the last thing we wanted to do is to, you know, give a page to the that lost parent or child or whatever a day or two ago and have it not work or have problems or like we had, we kind of owed it to them to make sure that we were further along than maybe what the company would become to get out there. There was also that we had a third kid last year. So that kind of also slipped and sound a little bit on the, on the development. But yeah, I think finding the right technical partners and, and now, you know, staff, we hired, we hired a CTO last year. He was wonderful. He was, I think he was brilliant. He was he had been advisor once for a handful of years. So he was very familiar with kind of what we were generating along and get and how many mm -hmm. So I think, you know, technically this place is one of that. And the other challenge is, you know, it's uh, sometimes people, you know, when you're doing discovery, you have to always kind of look at all the, the feedback you're getting from this perspective of, will they actually do that? Or are they just saying it because that's what they think I want to hear? So it's been really interesting since pages went live the last you know, few months ago, they kind of observe certain behaviors once we actually have something to get people versus just doing discovery in the front end before there actually was a product. So it's almost like it's full discovery, but it's, it's like a line in the sand between, you know, uh, way really more aspirational and more kind of like, like hypothetical discovery versus like actual, here it is. I'm going to see if you actually, I'm going to see how you use this and where you get stuff, if you get stuff, where do you abandon? 
why do you win? There are a lot of parties. I'd say some ways we've learned more in the last two months than we have in the last two years because the velocity of those learnings is becoming yeah. accelerated. So trying to iterate from that, trying to analyze that, trying to do to you know, maintain the yeah, updates with your investors of how your strategy is evolving and changing or what that means for different ways. It's all a challenge, but it's all, it's all kind of fun and it's incredibly stimulating. And I think that what, what gets, keeps us, you know, inspired and motivated, is just seeing the potential of the impact that we can have. There's, you know, I'll tell you one more story. The, uh, a little over a month ago, we had the first instance where a griever put on the only page on social media. It was, uh, it was a legacy use case that, you know, her person had passed away last May. So it wasn't 20 years ago, but it also wasn't a week ago. Mm-hmm. It was a big moment because we weren't sure, well, people were going to engage us. We were going to share pictures to us. How would they react? Would this griever feel let down that no one was engaging? There was, there was a risk. And she posted on Facebook and LinkedIn on Friday, February. And it was, you know, it was, it was beautiful to see that she had in her 50 posts that came in that day, that day and the next day mm-hmm. of all of, you know, her, her husband's colleagues and friends, buddies and some of their and cousins that were sharing pictures and stories and memories. And it was a very hard day for her because of course she's still in Greek and she's, you know, she's still more roles of her husband, but she was very grateful. She was very, she appreciated that now she has all this content and now moving forward, it's there for her as a crutch on important days on the anniversary when he was born and in the past or, you know, their wedding anniversary or on the random days, you know, Tuesday morning, Monday evening when she can't sleep or she has a bad dream and now she, you know, get taken or she, he, well, here's a song, sees a picture, has the memory that triggers a thought of him and now she's back in this. You know, wave of nostalgia. Great. Our goal is that she has this page now that she can go to and be reminded of all the wonderful things that he did and how people knew and walked him and slow knowing him up even after he passed. And hopefully it's a little bit hope it's really cathartic to her that now this exists and will always exist, you know, again as a culture. That's great. Yeah. And I'm sure that those types of wins you know, for you and Jordan and the rest of the team, like mean a lot. And, you know, it's been a lot of work to get there. I'm sure you're going to see more and more and more of those, and it's going to be very fulfilling. Awesome. So in the, in the last few minutes here, I want to ask a couple, couple different questions, like pivot a little bit, if, uh, if if that's cool with you. So as a startup guy, I think like a lot is changing in the startup scene to say the least, right? Interest rates, we've got this like SVB collapse craziness. You know, you invested in, worked for startups, like big question, but just what do you think the landscape looks like in the next year or two? Like, I'm sure you're thinking about it from a few different angles as an investor, a founder, you know, no one knows, but like, what, what do you think things are going to look like over the next year or two for, for startup founders? No, I, um, I try to stay, you know, I try to stay optimistic. Right? And I do think that things will be done hopefully faster than some people think. Uh, obviously, the events of the last week or two uh, with Silicon Valley Bank are a challenge, and you know, it remains to be seen. You know what other dominoes could fall, and what are certain repercussions or some reactions that were taken you know, on Sunday and since. So I could have to eat my words on this in the future, but you know I do think that I think what what, what the beauty that I find in startups in general is that you're solving customers' problems, and there are I don't see the rate of new problems arise blowing down. So there always will be room for new products and features and services to be provided to fill new needs. Same way that like the pandemic created, I mean, not Korean, but like pandemic created Zoom in a sense that like mm-hmm. now something random happened that had all of this disruption and transformation, which created openings and gaps for new companies to fill with solutions to this problem. So like that principle, I don't see that changing. So it's just a question of founders and early stage teams and VCs that are willing to back these teams of how, how skilled are they going to be and how persistent are they in attacking those problems and doing sufficient discovery and talking to their customers and, and, and delivering value. At the end of the day, happy paying customers are the backbone of their business. So 
if you can find happy paying, happy paying customers, regardless of what they look like or kind of, you know, what, what, what their model is, and you can work out the economics where it's a sustainable business, then I think some of the macro trends, they may slow you down a little bit, but they're not going to put you out. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm an interested party, as you said, in the, in the, in the few different areas, it's still happening. You know, I, I hear a lot of our active investment, so I'm still in touch with our founders constantly. You know, it was kind of fun because, you know, in the last two plus years, at one point I got like a, like a, like a graduate degree in, 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 in founder life and CEO life, because I was kind of on the sidelines and, and, and advisor and helping out. Yeah. About eight to 10 other CEOs around town and around the country. That was being able to observe how they handle challenges and what they did around fundraising or hiring or dealing with certain employee situations or dealing with public managers or sales teams or press, whenever, whatever the issues were. Um, so now that hopefully that you know, I'm going to see you know, some of that, some of that seasoning in addition to my experience working at startups, begin to kind of continue to, to, to add more value. But yeah, on the macro sense, I mean, I don't know. I think a lot of it kind of depends on, 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 on on how the Fed continues their plans, if they continue to raise rates, if they, if they lower rates, and they just kind of pause things. But obviously, that has a dramatic effect, you know, at a, at a macro level on 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 availability of funding. You know, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of powder kind of that is you know that is that is sitting with some of these these VCs, so when they feel comfortable deploying that, and how they deploy that, and when they deploy that, you know, just like you're trying to figure out you know, how's it going to work, like. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm optimistic because there's still innovation taking place everywhere and, and the need of that isn't slowing down. Question of can the, can founders have the creativity and the resource tools to find solutions and to develop that traction that can give confidence to investors, whether they're angels or VCs or whoever it is to, to, to give the resources, to give some, you know, some fuel to the, to, to those enterprises. Yeah. Yeah, that, that all makes sense. And I'm with you. I, I share in the optimism and. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think I agree with everything you said. And I think that, you know, startups inherently have to be very resilient. So like, it's just a little more challenging now. Um, Maybe it, like, it's, well, I think it's a good thing because now you can't like, not that in my parents can't call it or anything, but like, you can't kind of just like get drunk on funding and not care about the bottom line, not care about profitability. Like, you have to. It's almost like a, like, co it's like going back to fundamentals. And if you have strong fundamentals, you have happy customers and good margins, and like, you're gonna find success. Maybe your value, maybe you won't get the same, a multiple on an exit or a round that you would have got years ago, but you're, you're not going to go out of business if those, if those elements are still in place. Right. Yeah. I totally agree. And I think that some degree of like swinging back to normalcy was, was necessary. This is probably a little further than. <laughs> you weren't expected it to go, but it'll, it'll balance out, you know? Um, all right. So one last question in the last couple of minutes that I always like to ask guests. So, you know, if you were speaking to like a first time founder trying to launch their own new bid, like what's like one piece of advice that you think is pretty evergreen and, and, you know, has served you well or would serve them well. I think in order to get it so well, but it could be shame, right? I talk to customers. I think that's the most important thing. And in some ways, I wouldn't say ignore your competitors, but like maybe ignore your competitors. Big believe in that. If you're solving the customer's problem, then you're like hugging them in a sense. Your competitors don't really matter because if you're doing a good job of that, then there's no opening for them to matter. So it's all just about, you know, customer insights, it's discovery, it's getting feedback, it's feedback loops of how you're, what you're doing with that feedback. Are you listening? Are you, are you building off of that? I think that that's the foundation of it all. You know, I've, I've, I've seen a lot of teams that thought they had these great ideas and just built, 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 and they brought the customer and you're like, yeah, I don't really care. Maybe I'd buy them in at home, but like, but if you, if you bring them in at the beginning and you're constantly, again, like, hard to blame this, but like, it all comes down to a build shit that people want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you build shit that people want. You got a business. And if you, you find a way to scale that and the economics make sense and the pricing and margins, then you know, why aren't there? It's like, are you building through a, something that people want? Can you find authentic demand? And even if you have authentic demand, then you're on your way right to, 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 to the elusive product market fit. 
once you have that, you know, done. For sure. That's great advice. And I think it, it cannot be overstated, like spend time with your customers. I think that is kind of the crux. Of and also like, if you can, your customer, spend time with people that don't know you, that don't have any buyers, that yeah. are willing, that are willing to be very direct and saying, no, I want to use that. I don't like that. Yeah. Here's why. Yeah. Ask. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. This has been great. So I think we're about at time. I really enjoyed the interview. Thanks so much, Scott. Um, here. So before we sign off, where can listeners go to connect with you and to learn more about Mialma and what can they do to, you know, engage, support your mission? Yeah, thank you. You can go to mialma.com, M-I-A-L-M-A.com. You can follow us on Instagram, love Mialma. You can hit me up, per, uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm available, you know, S-C-O-T-T-E-R-O-G-E-T-I. Uh, and honestly, the, the thing about Mialma is that every person will will yeah will either be a griever or a supporter or you might be both many times so if there was one ask could have for listeners of this or watchers of this give us some feedback help us understand how we can better serve the needs that you have it's not this like private ownership thing where it's like you know we're balling this and you don't like we don't like the way we're doing it then you know screw you this is this is the right way we if this is this sounds like a good project so we 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 really want and are asking in our in our I'm grateful for every kernel of feedback that we get because everyone's a user, I guess. So, you know, almost like help us do a better job of serving the needs that you and everyone around us. Sounds great. Uh, well, thanks again for being on the show, Scott, and look forward to the continued growth of me, Alma. Thanks again. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Digital Footprint. This show is brought to you by Tyrannosaurus Tech, an award-winning technology partner dedicated to designing and developing high-impact software products. If you like what you heard in this episode, make sure to subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. For show notes and access to all episodes, please visit tyrannosaurustech.com slash blog. It's your footprint.